Welcome to Living the Smarter Science of Slim, where we provide a scientifically proven lifestyle for long-term health and fat loss by eating more and exercising less, but smarter. Eat smarter, exercise smarter, live better. I am so ready for that. Hey everyone, Jonathan Baylor back with another bonus Smarter Science of Slim podcast. A very unique and I anticipate excellent show for you today. We have a clinical psychologist with us who specializes in the treatment of anxiety disorders and related problems and has done so for more than two decades. He was the director for many, many years of the Anxiety Treatment Center in San Jose and Santa Rosa, California. He has written six books, uh, many of which are best-selling anxiety workbooks and have helped hundreds of thousands of readers throughout the world. We, we have none other than Dr. Edmund Bourne with us, and I wanted to share the good doctor's work because I got to tell you, we spend a lot of time worrying about how we look in this world. So, so when we talk about worry and anxiety and living a smarter, healthier, and happier life, knowing how to deal with some of this anxiety that comes up is just critical. So uh, Dr. Edmund Bourne or, or Ed, welcome to the show. It's a pleasure to be with you, Jonathan. Uh, and um, uh, looking forward to our short but uh, hopefully useful interview. Well, Ed, I know we were talking before the show, and you mentioned one of the issues we, we want to cover is cognitive behavioral therapy. And for something that can potentially take years to retrain the mind, you know, we've got about 30 minutes here, so we're going to try to power through a little bit. Well, um, there uh, are seven different anxiety disorders, uh, panic disorder, and then panic disorder with agoraphobia, which means you're not only having panic attacks, but you're restricting your activities as a result of those panic attacks. And then social phobia, where you're fearful of being in social situations, fearful of uh, uh, how you look or what you'll say uh, in social situations. Uh, then there is generalized anxiety disorder, which is a long way of just saying too much worry. Uh, people with generalized anxiety disorder are, are uh, excessively worrying. Uh, then there are specific phobias. Right? Your, your problem may be just a fear of flying or maybe just a, a fear of going to the dentist. Uh, beyond that, there are uh, the obsessive compulsive disorder, which really deserves to be a, a, a field of study of its own uh, because it's... Um, a little different uh, in terms of its nature and treatment from the other anxiety disorders. And finally, uh, number seven is post-traumatic stress disorder, which again is really its own field in terms of uh, the way you, uh, we think about it and the way it's treated. There's a, there are different organizations that uh, are devoted just to treating post-traumatic stress disorder, which is Long, long story short, is basically uh, a severe anxiety and recurring anxiety reaction someone has after a bad trauma, like being in a car accident or being raped or, you know, certainly common in combat situations. So uh, that's the that's the overview. Uh, we've well, got Ed, seven Ed, different things. If, if I can just jump in real quick here, uh, do you mind? Could could we focus? Certainly, this is a, a enormous field. Uh, many people are impacted by it, just just levels and levels of complexity. But I, I know myself, and I bet a bunch of our listeners, we, we might find ourselves sometimes thinking, "I just worry too daggone much, and I wish I could worry less." And we we may not have a disorder per se. I think we all worry. But l let me ask you two specific questions. One is. What is the difference, or how could we self-evaluate between a normal amount of worry and a disordered amount of worry? Uh, I think that's a, that's actually a subjective uh, uh, evaluation. The question is, are you suffering, and are you in distress because of the amount of worrying you're doing? Mm. Uh, would be criteria number one, and criteria number two is: Are you worrying about your own worrying? Are you are you, <laughs> yep. are you are you feeling anxiety because of the amount of worrying you find yourself involved with? So uh, uh, the the people who read my book uh, will will find that there are multiple ways you go about working with 
let's just say you're an excessive worrier, uh, there are uh, basically the standard of care is cognitive behavioral therapy and in severe cases, medication. Uh, so uh, hopefully people can benefit from natural approaches and CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, but if, if they really have a very severe situation, then they have to t start talking about uh, uh, medications like the SSRIs and the SNRIs and, the, or, and possibly even the tranquilizers. But let's just say you worry too much. Uh, well, first, you want to know, are you worried about a specific topic uh, and then we sort of need to explore, you know, where did that come from, what's going on there, and then cognitive behavioral therapy would involve both uh, a combination of practicing uh, deep relaxation techniques on a daily basis just to help you relax a little bit, as well as identifying the specific worrisome thoughts. Every worried thought begins with a what if. Whatever the worry is, it's always going to begin with a what if blank. So in cognitive behavioral therapy, we want to identify the specific what ifs uh, and then develop what are called counter statements to each of them. In other mm -hmm. words, instead of, uh, you know, what if the airplane crashes, uh, a counter statement is the, well, the odds of the airplane that I'm traveling on crashing are actually one in 17 million, which is which is the official odds. Um, or you know, what if I'm afraid uh, of going to the dentist? Uh, well, the counter statement is I can incrementally learn to be free of fears of going to the dentist. And then, not to get too complicated here, but Wherever there's a phobia, there needs to be what's called exposure. Long story short is to get over some uh, a situation you avoid, you've got to face it. But the way facing it is made possible is to do it in small incremental steps. Uh, I'll give you a quick example. Suppose you're afraid of flying. Well, uh, you're not going to go out and just take a flight. What you're going to do is you're going to go out and uh, do what's called the incremental process of, you know, maybe getting used to the airport, and then um, secondly, uh, you know, uh, uh, with the cooperation of the airlines actually boarding a plane and then getting off a plane that doesn't take off, uh, and then next, you know, ultimately making a very short flight with, with a support person going with you, and then beyond that, making a short flight with nobody with you, and then making a long flight with nobody with you. So that's what I mean by sort of trying to break down a, uh, the facing of a fear into a series of incremental steps, and, and that's that's critical to the cognitive behavioral approach. To Ed, Ed, I love with I love this idea of of, of breaking down a, a specific uh, source of worry and tackling that. And I I'm hoping we might be able to dig into a, a, a real life example here, and that is mm -hmm. I know a lot of of my, of my listeners we worry about our weight and, uh -huh. and, and I, I am not a PhD. I, I am not a clinical psychologist. So my flippant remark is, is throw your scale away. Like if it's not there, y you don't need to worry about it anymore. Just like throw it away, throw it away. And, and, and people say to me, Jonathan, you know, that's great. I love your energy, but it's not that easy. Um, so how can we, how can we work through this constant, worry, which for some of us may actually borderline on obsessive compulsive disorder about uh, this number, which, which really is, is, is not meaningful in and of itself. Well, there are a lot of ways to go with that, but, uh, uh, you know, the very first and, and most common sense thing is to uh, cut down on the amount of checking, uh, you know, uh, and in, the technical word for that is called is response prevention, or treating this as if it were an obsessive problem. Uh, certainly, the more you check your weight, the more you're going to be, you know, preoccupied with it. So um, gradually, maybe not all at once, cutting down the number of checks. Ideally, getting to the point where you, you might just have one check per day, or maybe one check for every three or four days. Um, uh, so. 
that's that would be you know one approach. Then getting a little more fine grained, we want to look at well, what are your specific? What are the specific worries? What are the what are the what ifs you're telling yourself about your weight or about your inability to lose weight? And let's let's identify those, and then let's develop constructive counterstatements to them. Um, so, uh, well, and Ed, I love that's the, the those counterstatements. That's what I want to drill into because, again, mm-hmm. you're you're the expert here. The thing that I have found in in my own experience and in working with clients back in my personal trainer days is one of those what if statements is, for example, if I weigh five more pounds on some level, people won't like me as much. Like either my spouse won't find me attractive, but, but, but the worry there to me isn't actually about the weight. The worry Uh is about someone treating you differently based upon what you think would be a negative change in your physical appearance. Okay. And, and the reason I dig into that is like, let's say for example, we actually do resistance training and we build up our muscles If we build up our muscles, we'll gain weight. But oftentimes that will result in a positive change in our physical appearance. So when we hang our hat on this number on the scale, we we are worried about something that actually has very little bearing on the actual things we're worried about, which is how people maybe treat us or think about us. What, What do you, what do you think about that? Okay, that's a long question. Um, I'm gonna. I, I'm hoping I'm really ad- addressing your question. What do you? Do? I, I think your question boils down to um, worrying about the number and worrying about getting over that number. And uh, what are people going to think of me if I gain five pounds or ten pounds? Uh, and I would. Uh, I would. I would say that one thing that's indicative of all worries is that they overestimate the odds of uh, unpleasant or even dangerous consequences. And number two, they un- you underestimate your ability to cope. Mm. So let's you know. So first, you deal with the overestimates of uh, oh gosh, I'm a, you know if I gain five or ten pounds. Uh, X, Y, Z is not going to like me as well. Uh, and um, you look at, what are the odds of that really being true? You know, I mean, what are the odds if I gain 10 or 15 pounds that uh, I'm going to experience some some level of rejection as a result of that? And um, usually the, the, the person who's doing the worrying is overestimating the risk of negative consequences. Uh, now, if you've got a, a spouse who's on your case about your appearance, well, then that's then we then we're dealing with a marital problem, and we're dealing with couples therapy, and we're dealing with you know what are reasonable expectations and so forth. Uh, you know, I'm not denying that that uh, some of your listeners may have somebody very important in their life that is not. Uh, fully uh, accepting of their present weight. So <clears throat> then I guess we have to talk about, well, um, under the other part of it, the underestimating your ability to cope. Um, then we have to look at, well, what can you do to cope? I mean, if your spouse is having problems because of your appearance, uh, you know, let's Let's work on that. Let's, let's you know, maybe have a, a session with a couple therapist and see what we can do, I mean, to perhaps all help the spouse alter their expectations or uh, perhaps help the person with a weight issue to take constructive steps that will be effective to diminish weight. And, of course, I'm not an expert on weight control and weight management. Uh, there are many, many ways to go about it working with that that uh, your listeners probably are more familiar with than I am. I've always had a, you know, I'll admit that I've always had a, had a problem with underweight, uh, which, you know, people also who are then worried about not fitting the stereotype. Well, and, and, uh, and I, 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 yeah, I think that the, the key, the key distinction I'm, I'm looking at here is, 
is there are things which hypothetically, let's say a, a woman walks into a party and she looks fabulous. She looks radiant. Her smile just glistens. Her hair looks lovely. The way she carries herself, the way she engages with people, she lights up the room. And I were to tell you that that woman weighs 200 pounds. Like, uh-huh. it would not matter. That no one cares. This number is so meaningless in and of itself. Let me give you another example. If you look up a picture of me on the internet, you will probably not think I'm overweight. According to my weight, uh-huh. I'm borderline obese. I happen to carry quite a bit of muscle on my body. So we have well, who this... Who decides n- that? Who decides that you're overweight or obese? Who, who, who decides that? Well, that's what I'm saying. So there is... There's easy the American Dietary Association? Exactly. Oh, I mean, yes. I mean, yes. But that's... So, so how, do we, how do we combat that when we are... When we are... When we have our value tied to this number, which... Even uh, science clearly shows that, like, for example, your waist circumference does have bearing on mortality rates, but your weight in and of itself really doesn't. So, but we use this scale, we get preoccupied with it, we're constantly weighing ourselves. How do we break that cycle? The, there's, there's no quick and easy answer other than to reduce the number of checks. Mm-hmm. You know, maybe reduce it gradually, but to reduce it, you know, mm-hmm. to get it down from you know, many times a day to once, you know, maybe twice a day and then get it down to once a day and then get it down to once every three or four days if possible. And that just is an act of will. I mean, it's uh, that kind of uh, effort uh, takes courage and willpower to sustain. And that's what, I mean, it sounds kind of commonsensical, but that is what you do uh, about you want to reduce your checking um, and you want to reduce the perception that a, that a certain number is bad because the, the question is bad according to who? I mean, um, you know, it, it, I mean, even if you are a little overweight, as you said, I mean, you can dress yourself and um, do, you know, uh, if you're a woman, cosmetic things and things with your hair that can uh, allow you to be strikingly beautiful, even if you are 20 pounds over the norm. Um, in addition to that, I think, you know, just a reminder, hey, this is a very cultural thing mm-hmm. uh, in America and in Western Europe. If I'm part of Hawaiian culture, it's like really a uh, very uh, 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 a very good thing to look overweight, and there are many cultures outside of the United States and Western Europe where uh, people are actually it's preferable to be overweight. It means you're well fed. It means you're from a you know uh, an outstanding and financially well off family if you're a little robust. Um, well, and, and I, in, I, I also so, I love. So again, this, where you have this cultural obsession in the U.S. and in Western Europe and a few other places with being thin, and it is, it's, it is, it's a, a, it's a cultural lie that's unfortunately gotten sold by the people that are out there to make money off of weight reduction. So. Um, that's that's my take. Well, no, I I I, I love I love that, and I, I love what you said also about it, Jonathan. There's no I, I can't just give you this this easy answer because it, the other thing I I heard from from what you were saying and just from knowing a bit about your research is if you're checking your weight constantly and you're constantly worried about your weight, like you the, you said, there's no easy answer, and I, and I anticipate checking the re- gets worry. I- exactly. And then worry begets checking. It's a circular. Exactly. Um, and you're not, I would. Less checking, it, less worry. <laughs> exa- well, and it seems like you're also not, the, the reason it's not easy to stop is because you're not really doing that just to check your weight. Like there, it sounds like there's something deeper and we, it would be that we would need to address that deeper. What is, what is the why that is driving you to check your weight constantly? Well, yeah, I, I would assume worry about uh, disapproval from uh, uh, loved ones or uh, just, you know, everybody. Uh, and and so then you have to, uh, you know, look at, I just go back to uh, people who, who worry, uh, overestimate the 
bad consequences. Mm-hmm. They're overestimating rejection or disapproval from what it actually is going to be. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, now, okay, let's take the person who's really, really overweight, who's you know really quite obese. Yes, there is a, within our culture a certain disapproval of uh, of that. Um, but you know where I would go from there is that if you look at surveys, 80% of the of the American population has something wrong. You know, some diagnosable problem within the uh, DSM, the, the the psychiatric manual for disorders. That leaves 20% of people that don't have some diagnosable problem. Uh, so. So your issue is is weight, you know. Your issue is you're a little overweight. Okay, well, the next person, you know, might have an issue, you, you know, with uh, uh, high blood pressure, and the next person might have an issue with, um, you know, something much more serious than being overweight. Let's, you know, let's say ALS or muscular dystrophy, or is eighty percent of the population has something wrong. So. If your if yours is being weighing too much, okay, that's yours. Uh, it, it, it it's got to be taken out of part of one's evaluation of oneself. Having self, you know, the whole basis of self esteem is to get away from the idea that your appearance is the basis of your self esteem. And I think that's the that's the knot that has to be untied. That's the knot mm-hmm. that has to be cut. Is that your self-esteem is dependent on how you look, that that you're not inherently valuable, worthy, good person, regardless of, of your weight. Uh, that uh, that's that's where you, it ultimately has to go. It has to go to basing your self-esteem on on true criteria and not on superficial criteria. Well, I, I love that, Ed, and I think you you hit an interesting point in there when you talked about the eighty percent of us. Well, probably 100% of us are not perfect. And certainly when we talk about individuals who are checking the scale, if you weigh 450 pounds, like that's not healthy. And you're probably also not checking the scale every day because you don't need to stand on the scale to know that you weigh Mm -hmm. an excessive amount, right? We're talking generally people that do this, in my experience, are people where if you looked at them, you would not think they're overweight at all. And they're fretting, Mm -hmm. like to your point of they're overestimating. If you were to gain 50 pounds of body fat, that's a bad idea. And you should stop and you should get help because that's not healthy. But most people aren't mm-hmm. worried that they're going to step on the scale tomorrow and weigh 50 pounds more. They're worried mm-hmm. about these one to two pound fluctuations. And Ed, to your point, nobody, even if you did gain two pounds of body fat, as long as you don't do that for 30 days in a row, nobody mm-hmm. is going to treat you any differently in, Absolutely. Because you gain two pounds of body fat or because you gain two pounds of water weight because it happens mm-hmm. to be that time of the month. Like it's, it's the, mm-hmm. and, and that's, I love your point about we're just, we're over, let's say it does happen. Who, mm-hmm. what's going to change? And it's I think, all, that, yeah, it, it, it's all what you it's all just your own perception, self perception. Uh, nothing has changed from an external point of view. If you gain five pounds, nothing has changed from an external point of view. It's just, it's just, you know, uh, obsessing with with the, with numbers. Uh, I mean, you could obsess about, uh, I suppose, uh, wrinkles around your eyes, or you could obsess about um, a number of physical things that occur with aging. Like you can discuss mm-hmm. about the fact that you're, uh, you might have some uh, loose skin in your neck, or you might, you know, you might have some jowls in your cheeks because you're getting older. I mean, it's, yeah, I mean, <laughs> bodily focus, excessive bodily focus. So, uh, uh, you can go in many places. So weight is certainly a very popular one, but yeah, you know, all of these. All these things have to ultimately have the same answer. You aren't who you appear. You aren't the looks. You know, and unfortunately, there's a lot of advertising that would want you to believe that you are your looks. But in truth, you're you know, you're you're much as a human being. Your inherent value is based on you know far deeper and significant criteria than your looks. So it, it, it's 
it's like getting away from that kind of um, it's it's just, it's a you know it's a cultural obsession as that's become an individual obsession and uh, you know it is uh, you know if I was counseling somebody I would just work on you know finding ways to uh, evaluate you know and if, apart from doing less checking which is really the first step is is, is finding legitimate values for self worth and self esteem. Uh, getting out of the, the trap of basing it on your looks. Ed, I think that is just, I, I want to end on that because I think that is such a powerful message, which is focus on the other. If, if let's say, even if you do think you're not beautiful or not this in this certain way, you are beautiful in other ways and more important ways. And if we can focus, because Ed, often we talk about the idea is not just to eat less food. That's starvation. That's unhealthy. You need to eat higher quality mm-hmm. food. It's almost like yeah, we do the same exactly. thing here. Think about Get away from the process stuff. Exactly, and think about higher. Give yourself higher quality thoughts and focus on the on the higher order bits of why you are valuable. And maybe you could even then crowd out those negative thoughts. Over time, you can. I love it. I love it. Well, Ed, thank you so much. And, and folks, obviously, we are only able to scratch the surface. This is obviously a hugely complicated area. And, and, and Dr. Bourne has spent just decades breaking it down. He's got many books you can check out. He's got the Anxiety and Phobia Workbook, Healing Fear, Beyond Anxiety and Phobia, Coping with Anxiety, and A Natural Relief for Anxiety. And all of that and more can be found at his wonderful website, which is Help for anxiety.com again that's help for anxiety.com and the the man is dr edmund Bourne, phd clinical psychologist ed thank you so much for sharing your time with us today i really appreciate it thank you jonathan it's been an honor folks i hope you enjoyed today's show as much as i didn't remember this week and every week after eat smarter exercise smarter and live better talk with you soon Wait, wait, don't stop listening yet. If you like the podcast and if there's other ways we can help you, please join us in the Smarter Science of Slim support group, which is freely available at the Smarter Science of Slim website, smarterscienceofslim.com. There you'll find all kinds of free recipes and success stories and just all kinds of fun stuff like how to help your kids go sane and just great community content. And just one last thing before you go, if you wouldn't mind heading over to iTunes and up onto Amazon.com and leaving us a review and then going over to Facebook and liking us, we would hugely...